The NFL is turning the corner and heading into the home straight of the regular season. And if you're the Kansas City Chiefs or Philadelphia Eagles, you're enduring a two-game wobble at exactly the wrong time in the campaign. If you're the Buffalo Bills, though, you're still very much in the thick of the race for the playoffs. And if you're the Miami Dolphins, you're probably wondering what on earth happened in the final six minutes of your Monday night football defeat to the Tennessee Titans. For the show, we went 2-1 and one against the line last weekend. The Kansas City Chiefs, the only team to let us down as both the Bengals and the Cowboys delivered on the goods. For the season, that record has now improved to 23-19 and 19 against the line. And I keep highlighting the fact, if you're with us in weeks one and two, one and five the record through those two weeks. That means since week three, the show is 22 and 14 against the line. We are very much on a heater at the moment at the business end of the season. And as we look ahead to the final four weeks of the campaign and also reflect on some talking points, we've got a very special guest to join us and analyze it all. So without further ado, let's turn the page and head on into week 15 in the NFL. Well, welcome along to the show. This is Graves on Gridiron, and I am your host, Richard Graves. If you are a regular listener to this podcast, great to have you with us again. If you are new to the show, it is never too late to join us. And if it's just the name of Jeff Reinbold that has attracted you to this week's podcast, we make no excuses. Jeff and I go back nearly a decade now. Uh, we've <laughs> endured some interesting games along the way. We've also experienced some absolute thrillers as well. We've been on tour doing shows in Ireland previously, as well as working together uh, professionally over that period at the same time. And uh, now that he's back in the UK working for Sky Sports, I could think of no better person to reflect on what was uh, certainly a week 14 that had no shortage of talking points. And it sets us up for the final four weeks of the regular season absolutely perfectly now as teams vie for places in the postseason. The number one seed is on the line in both the NFC and AFC. Teams getting hot at the right time. Teams losing form, perhaps a little worryingly, at exactly the wrong time. So here we go. Let's look ahead to week 15 with this week's guest, Jeff Reinbold. Jeff, great to see you. It's been far too long, um, but it, it's been a busy period both for you back in coaching um, in the CFL. Now great to see you on TV over here. And the NFL's at the business end of the season. Uh, we'll reflect on a, a couple of the storylines from week 14 in, in a moment. But there's no shortage of drama or excitement, is there? It's the National Football League, man. And I'm just telling you, it, it's going to get better each week as the pressure ratchets up and we start to separate, you know, the ones that are and the ones that ain't. And how about <laughs> them Cowboys? I just got to <laughs> throw that out there right now. Do, do you know, Jeff, it's good to hear somebody else Get, give credit where it's due because I, I've got plenty of colleagues and friends who just don't seem to want to get on the bandwagon. I'm feeling that you're a believer right now. Well, you know, Richard, I, I like you and I have talked and we've been friends for a long time. And, you know, I always have to temper, you know, the, you know, the hype of the Cowboys. And, and when you stra when you, when you are wearing your cowboy boots, that you bought in Texas, that <laughs> you are a deep believer, man. And so I've always been that guy that's like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just telling you, I don't see a weakness in this football team. And and there's no perfect team this year. I don't I really don't believe that. But you know Not the even Cowboys, the 49ers. No, I don't think so. I you know, I think we've seen that they have a they have some issues too. And you know in some ways, when you compare the 49ers and the Cowboys, if the Cowboys can jump on the 49ers at the start of a game and, and get them to play from behind, right, that's when I think the Cowboys will beat them because the Cowboys, that defense runs so well and plays the pass and rushes the passer, attacks the passer so well. When you, when you strip away the 49ers' ability to use play action and all the things that they do to give Brock Purdy his best opportunity to succeed. You can, I think you can get after them. They don't, they're not built to drop back and throw the ball 45 times a game, you know? So that to me would be the key. If they could play the 49ers in Jerry world and get off at the start of the game, get a 10 or 14 point lead. 
I think it would be a really, really interesting game. Well, I tell you what, Jeff, whilst the, the Cowboys and, the, and uh, 49ers might have nice problems to deal with at the moment, what one organization that certainly um, has a few issues are the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, all the talk, obviously, in the fallout was the reaction of Patrick Mahomes. Andy Reid called the, the officiating embarrassing, which you'll know better than most of us, is extremely outspoken language for him. But I, I, I've seen uh, Dan Olofsky look back on it, um, back at the tape. And, and it's not just that one occasion that Kadarius Tony is blatantly stood in an offside position. There's four or five other occasions during the course of, of that game. Now, I get the argument that the officials didn't warn um, the Chiefs or Tony himself, but equally the Chiefs admit that Kadarius Tony never checks with the officials either. Where, where do you stand on this? And is this just symptomatic of the growing frustration within the Chiefs organization this year? Well, the great Muhammad Ali once said, I'm going to shock and amaze you. And if you're an official who's ever stood on the sidelines <laughs> during one of our games, I'm sure they're going to say, there's no way he said that. I'm siding with the officials here. I'm on the side of the guys in the striped shirts for once because there is, let me just put it this way, Richard. His mistake was the mistake you might get from a junior high age kid because a receiver has been taught and told and I don't know, maybe a million times when you're on the line, you look inside first, then you go to the side judge and ask him, just give a thumbs up or a thumbs down if I'm okay. Tony didn't do that. As a matter of fact, he was so blatantly offsides. And and I know Andy says six inches or a foot. Nah, -uh. look at the look at the film. He is blatantly the official. The side judge couldn't even check, couldn't even see the ball. Now, what's incredible about this, and where I think Andy lost credibility with his argument is there were numerous times in the game where the Chiefs didn't have enough guys on the line of scrimmage, right? And those are detail problems. Those are issues with accountability and details. And you look at the Chiefs, and this is the football team. Of all the teams in the National Football League, they have dropped more passes than any team in football. And you've got one of the most accurate passers throwing the balls to them. So what, is that, what does that say to me as a guy who's been in coaching for a long time? They've got accountability issues, technique issues, and attention to detail issues that are manifest not only in their drops, but in the fact that they can't do the simplest of all things, which is line up correctly. Yeah, and ultimately, it's not just one mistake here, one mistake there. The, these are now game-changing mistakes, and they're turning potential victories into losses. You know what, Richard? You're exactly right. And I'm going to tell you, again, my experience in this business, if you have guys that don't pay attention to detail and are lazy mentally, right? Not lazy physically, lazy mentally, they will break your heart at the worst possible moments. And that's exactly what happened with Kadarius Tony. Now, I'm not, an, I'm not a hater at all. You know me better than that. But one of the reasons Kadarius Tony is not in New York is the same reasons if he doesn't get it fixed, he's not going to be in Kansas City much longer either. Yeah, for certain. So problems in the AFC for the Kansas City Chiefs. Do we have problems in the NFC now for the Philadelphia Eagles? And I know this sounds crazy because at 10 and 3, they're tied for the best record in football. But you remember this defensive front, which was on a record setting pace for sacking opposing quarterbacks last year? Well, if you look over the, the three-game stretch when they played the Chiefs and they played the Buffalo Bills and the 49ers, they, they weren't just not pressuring the quarterback. They only had four sacks combined in those three games. Now, I know they got to Dak Prescott on five different occasions on Sunday night in that defeat over in Jerry World, but they're the 29th ranked pass defense in the NFL. Teams in the recent five-game span are averaging 29.4 points a game. They've tried to bring in a bit of veteran help um, at, the, at the linebacker with Shaquille Leonard. For, for as well as they've played over the last 12 months, do we have problems in Philadelphia? Well, certainly I think anytime your statistics tell you that, I mean, those are, those are, you know, revealing statistics. This is a team that for 
as many great pass rushers as they have, especially on third down, they're one of the worst pass rush teams in the league on third down. Now, part of that is what's going on in the back end. Right now, Bradbury and uh, Darius Slay are not playing very well, right? And, you know, they went out and got Keith Byer to help their safety situation. He has. But this is a football team that's really under underachieving, particularly on defense. And I think Sean Desai has got to – he's got to shake that thing up because, you know, that's too good a football team. There's too many good football players to give up points like they're giving up and, and not being able to get stops. And, you know, in this day and age in the National Football League, there, there, are, no, there are no 85 Bears anymore, all right, unless you're playing somebody that's just junk on offense. But – you have to get stops, and they just can't get stops at critical times. Um, I think the other thing, and and uh, we talked about this on the on the broadcast at Sky, and I really wish we had a chance to really break it down because it was really evident when I looked at the All-22 tape. Nick Bosa said that they had the blueprint for beating the Eagles. So I went in and I watched the tape, Richard, and I spent a lot of time breaking it down, ran it through the computer that I use, and what they did, uh, what Steve Wilkes was able to do to make Jalen Hurts be a quarterback, not be an athlete who runs around and makes plays with a great arm and great, you know, great feet and, you know, but really make him get in the pocket, go through his read progression, avoid the, you know, again, not have his eyes into the rush because he does look down into the rush a lot. They did something that I had never, ever seen done before, where they actually put all of the DBs in straight man-to-man coverage. There's no safety in the middle of the field. They blitz and engage the running back, so you, you couldn't get the ball to him. They took the screen away, and then they sat two guys as spies. So he had a spy on each side of the quarterback. Normally, you only spy with one guy because you want somebody free in the middle. Well, what they saw on tape is that as soon as – he feels any kind of pressure. His eyes go away from the receivers and go down to the rush looking for a place to bail out. And particularly, he's, he bails out in the B gap, which is that gap between the guard and the tackle. And once he's in there, then he can make plays. Well, they took all that away, and you saw what, what happened you know, against, against the Niners. There were times he was back there with four seconds left. I mean, excuse me, four seconds where he's standing there holding the ball and he can't find any place to go with it. And he and he's he panics. And one time he just sat down. So, you know, I think that the Cowboys also saw that and they did a great job of orchestrating their pass rush and really being coordinated on how they went after him. And, you know, when you take when you play in pro football, if there's something you don't do very well, other teams are going to make you make you do that the entire game and I I think that's where I would be concerned if I'm you know Nick Sariani you got to get some diversity in that passing game yeah for sure now as we say 10 and 3 you look at the the remaining games on their schedule they're at Seattle this week then they're at home to the Giants home to the Cardinals away at the Giants to, to round off the regular season if they win out they win the NFC East by virtue of holding the tiebreaker over the Cowboys and they've got a minimum locked in number two seed. The question I've got, Jeff, after Monday night football and the Giants stunning the Packers, is that remaining schedule now as straightforward as it might have appeared at the start of uh, week 15? I think everybody's got to understand these guys are all pros. They're all good players. They're no bad players in the National Football League. So if you don't come to play, and I'm not saying that the Packers didn't come to play or the, the Dolphins didn't come to play, but the reality of it is, you know, as we say, they get paid just like you do. And there are there are going to be games that you need to win. And if you think you're just going to show up and, and throw your helmet out there and they're going to run away from you, you better think again. And, and we saw that last night. I think this for Philadelphia in particular, this game with Seattle, where you have to go from east to west through four time zones, play up in the northwest where it's going to, you know, who knows what kind of weather you're going to get play in a stadium that's as loud as any in the National Football League. This is a big, big week for the Eagles. And I, you know, again, Seattle, we've seen Seattle, you know, they, they'll put you to the test and they'll compete. So this is a huge week for the Eagles. And just wrapping up on week 14, 
What about the Miami Dolphins, Jeff? I really don't know what to, to make of this Dolphins side. One moment they're blowing opponents off the field. The next they're dropping games that, frankly, they should be winning by double digits when you look at the form guide. And on Monday Night Football, they were leading by 14 with less than six minutes left in the game. They gave up 15 points inside a three-minute spell at home and lose to the Tennessee Titans, which also cost them the number one seed as it stands in the AFC. Yeah, and, I, and you know, that's an epic collapse, really, because if you're the Dolphins, home field advantage, and I've said this, uh, I've been beating this drum for a month. If you're the Dolphins, you want that number one seed because you want to play in warm weather on that fast track down in Hard Rock Stadium because that's how your football team is built. And then play, play at home through the playoffs and go to the Super Bowl and play indoors, right? It's not, you couldn't set it up any better for your team. And then you host a four and eight football team at your place on Monday night and you go out and lay an egg in the fourth quarter and lose. You know, that, that's why I say, Richard, there are no perfect teams. Right. There's no team. There's no dynasty team that, you know, when the Cowboys, you go back to you know, we'll use your Cowboys as an example. When Aikman and, and uh, that crew were together, if they had a game that they needed to win, they won it because they had they, they had that kind of maturity in their in their football team. You know, and um, right now you would have to question the, the, the Dolphins because there have been too many up and down performances. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. And they do have a point to prove right now, sitting just behind the Baltimore Ravens in the race for that number one seed in the AFC. OK, let's turn our attention then to week 15. Four games left to go in the regular season for all these teams. We're done with the bye weeks. Everybody plays from here on in. We have three games on Saturday night to go along with the Thursday night football game. I think we're both agreed we won't mention your Raiders and the Chargers for Thursday night, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> My Raiders set offensive football back decades in that game. That was <laughs> ugly. That was ugly. And you know what, though? On, on the other hand, right, because I always – I'm a half glass, half, half full guy, right? But You're going to have to sell this one to me in that case. Well, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just happy for Coach Flores, right, who really, you know, flamed out in Miami – spectacularly sued the nfl i mean his 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 career not wasn't it wasn't in jeopardy but you know there were a lot of things about it that weren't you know weren't what you'd want him to be and he made the investment in his future going to minnesota and has absolutely fixed a defense that couldn't stop anybody a year ago and they really do play good defense up there and i think for Coach Flo, that's a, you know, a real positive step in his reclamation project. Yeah, for sure. And that leads us nicely onto the first game we're going to look at in the Week 15 schedule because the Broncos go to the Detroit Lions. The Lions have a two-game two lead at the top of the NFC North over the Minnesota Vikings, who, as you point out, despite all sorts of adversity and injury issues this year, are still in the hunt and very much in the thick of the race for a place in the postseason. Um, on the face of it, look... The Detroit Lions uh, have been one of the revelations of the season. They have a 9-4 and four record leading the, the NFC North. And you'd think they'd be favorites at home against a 7-6 and six Denver Broncos side. And you look at the, the line going into this, they're four-point favorites. But I've got to tell you, Jeff, am I the only one that has reservations about the Lions right now? Because over the last month, they don't appear to me to be playing the kind of football that you want to be playing at the business end of the season if you're going to make a deep run into the postseason. Well, again, we talked about maturity, right? And maturity is when you have a mature football team, you don't have the highs and lows. You basically function at a high level all the time. Now, there are some things about the Lions when you look at them that say, okay, they're not quite there yet, right? I, I really think that their roster is probably two years away. I'm concerned as a Lions fan that my quarterback is a little bit of a yo-yo. He's kind of up and down, and you really don't know sometimes what you're going to get. Um, 
you know, he can be hot and throw for 300 and three touchdowns and, and without an interception, or he can have that look on his face that we used to see when he was in St. Louis and, and uh, Los Angeles with the Rams. And, you know, they were playing the Patriots in the Super Bowl, and he looked like a kid that, that you know, was afraid to go to school. And, you know, you know, who are they? That's the thing that's so frustrating with these Lions. And I don't know right now with the Lions, and this is why I say there's no, there's no perfect team. I don't know if the Lions are good enough on defense. You know, can they grind out? And you have to do this sometimes in playoff football. Can they grind out a 14-10 game, a 17-14 game, a 20, you know, 2017 game? I just don't know if they've got that kind of, you know, uh, maturity yet. And, and again, um, you know, here, week four, everybody was saying, you know, Dan Campbell's going to be coach of the year and they were the sweethearts of the league and all that. And right now they better watch themselves because there's other teams nipping at their heels. Well, to back up what you've just been saying there, in the last five games, the Lions have given up at least 26 points on defense in, on each outing. Jared Goff, he's given the ball away on nine different occasions over a four-game period in the last month. And now they come up against a defense which all the, the league statistics say, oh, the, the Broncos' defense aren't that good. But the reason it says that is because the first month of the season, they were shocking. Remember, they gave up 70 on the road to Miami. Since then, they've turned it around. They, they're still fourth in the league with 22 takeaways this season. And against somebody in Jared Goff that appears to be a little careless um, with the ball, you see this Broncos coming in red hot. They've, they've won six of the last seven. And the reason that isn't seven in a row is because they couldn't punch it into the end zone as time expired in Houston two weeks ago. Uh, and suddenly. They're right there in the mix for a place in the postseason. You know what? They're a better football team than a lot of people believe, you know, because they were so bad last year. And then early in the season, the defense gives up 70, 70 and 700 yards, right? Well, you're never going to be high in, in the defensive rankings after that because, it's you know, I mean, that's just such an, such an outlier. But I, Vance Joseph, who is a kid I coached in NFL Europe, the defensive coordinator, I'm really proud of Vance. Because he could have folded after that, right? And that defense could have folded and revolted and had all kinds of locker room issues. But they haven't. And he got rid of some older players, right? He got rid of two aging pass rushers, Frank Clark and, and uh, you know, what that what they did Randy Gregory. was. Yeah, Randy Gregory. And they got younger, better character and started to build this, the defense. You know, you talk all the time about being good down the middle on defense well you've got Alex Singleton number 49 who I think is a pro bowl player he's a tackling machine you look at his play production numbers they're always the top amongst the top in the National Football League he has I think he's got the second highest tackle total in a single game in NFL history right I mean the guy all he does is make plays but nobody knows him Right. And then you go behind him and you got Simmons. And I'm going to tell you, if Goff is careless with the football, Simmons is an, I mean, he's a, he attracts the football. McMillian's starting to play, right? They've got players right now. And I think Sean Payton, you know, and I'm not a big Sean Payton fan. I'm not, a, I don't dislike him either. I'm just kind of ambivalent. But right now, how could you not have Sean Payton in the coach of the year conversation? Yeah, for sure. So if I said to you, Jeff, that you're on the road coaching this Denver Broncos side with a four-point start. Are you taking the Broncos? I would. Well, I'm with you on this one, Jeff. I'm taking the uh, Broncos as well with a four-point start, which leads us on to another gigantic matchup. The Dallas Cowboys, we've already touched upon them, 10-3 and three on the uh, record this season, go to the 7-6 and six Buffalo Bills. They're only one game in front of 500, but they might be one of the best teams not to be in the playoffs if they were to begin today. Uh, the Bills are a narrow one and a half point favorites. And when you consider that usually you'll get three points automatically for home field advantage, it tells you how tight everybody sees this game as potentially being. Um, I've got to say, credit to the Bills last weekend. I didn't think they'd be able to go up to Arrowhead and get the job done uh, against the Chiefs. They did. Um, I've got to say Josh Allen as well, especially since Joe Brady became offensive coordinator seems to be playing in a more mature fashion is probably the kindest 
way to put it. It's well documented how many turnovers he's committed this season. Uh, but it, when this Bills team plays good, solid, sensible football, they've got to be one of the toughest teams to beat in the NFL. Yeah, and, you know, um, one of the things that they've had an issue with, the Bills, is closing games out. Now, I, I went to the Bills uh, Broncos game, and, you know, they win the game. They, the game's over. The game is over. And then all of a sudden you look on the field and there's a yellow flag and they got 12 guys on the field on a, on a missed field goal. So they give the Broncos a chance to kick it again. The guy kicks it, makes it, and they walk off winners. The Bills have found ways to lose. Now, what they did against Kansas City, and you can say, well, they really didn't do anything. It was Kadarius Tony's screw-up that, that kept them, you know, preserve the win but they got out of Kansas City with a W and that's huge for them because it kept them alive they are facing a tough final four games of the season I mean a tough one but there's not going to be any tougher than facing a red hot cowboy team where do they have an advantage or where do I see that they got a chance Obviously, Josh Allen can make plays no other quarterback in the league can make, and I'm including Patrick Mahomes in that because I think I think there's no question that Josh Allen's a better runner out of the pocket. Um, the other thing I think is going to be key is the weather. It's supposed to be eight degrees on game time. Now, if it's eight degrees, the Cowboys that's that's good because it's December in Buffalo, and you might get eight <laughs> feet of snow, much less eight degrees. So if, if the weather holds up, I'm, I like the Cowboys, but if the weather becomes a factor and it's cold and it's more than the cold, the wind in Buffalo, where cut, kicking and punting the ball and also throwing the ball becomes more difficult. Although Dak's got a good enough arm, Josh is, is uniquely suited for that weather because he's so strong. He, he just throws the ball right through it. But um, I, I think I, I think that it's – going to be exactly what you said Richard I think it's going to be a down to the last possession game I, I wonder how significant that the, the loss of Matt Milano at linebacker is coming into this game because you know we talk about the interceptions Josh Allen's thrown 14 this season if the Bills can keep it tight they found a run game this year James Cook especially out of the backfield has given them another dimension so if they can keep it tight they can play their game if they fall behind and play catch up Without Matt Milano there to, to marshal the, the middle of the field, is that when this game becomes a problem for Buffalo? Well, I think, you know, Milano's loss is, you know, you can't underestimate that. I mean, he, he really is, was the best, in my opinion, covered linebacker in the National Football League, right? And, you know, they've been through a transition at linebacker, you know, all year. And, you know, they're nicked up in the secondary. They go out and get Rasul Douglas, who has been an absolute find for them. If you noticed, he, he shadowed Kelsey most of the game the other night. He has the ability to do that. I don't know if they're going to put him on C.D. Lamb or not, but that's probably their best chance. But to me, the key thing is the play of those safeties because Micah Hyde went out against Kansas City with a stinger. And yeah. you know neck injuries are sometimes really, really dicey. So if he can't play... You know, again, that means, you know, that that they've got to bring in a backup. And even though, you know, it's a pretty good player. Right. But you're, you're still talking about a second team player. Uh, he Poyer and Hyde are maybe the best safety combination in football. Um, but again, up front, Ed Oliver's got to play well. You, you know, they've got to have to get Epinesa and Floyd and and, uh, you know, they got to get after the passer. They got to get pressure on Dak. They got to keep him, even if they don't sack him, they've got to make him uncomfortable in the pocket. And, you know, when you look at them, you certainly have, they've got the people to do it. Shaq Lawson, they've got a number of guys that they can roll at you. Cowboys front's got to hold up and, you know, they've got to find a way to get pressure on the quarterback. Yeah, for sure. And for, for Buffalo, you look at their remaining schedule now. If they can beat Dallas, they go to the Chargers, they're at home to New England, and then final day of the regular season, what are the odds on this one being moved to Sunday night football and flexed out? They are at Miami in what potentially could be a showdown for the, the uh, AFC West or AFC East division title. Um, so it, it's still in their hands but it's a gauntlet of a schedule that they've got to run when you consider the Cowboys and the Dolphins there. Um, which way are you leaning on this one, Jeff? 
Well, I think, you know, I really think the Buffalo Bills should be in the playoffs. They're, they're good. They're talented enough to be in the playoffs. They have put themselves in a very precarious situation. And again, this game this week, now, this is what, this is what Buffalo's done to themselves. Kansas City was, if, if they don't win it, they're probably not going to get in the playoffs. They won it. Now they got to play the Bill. I mean, they got to play the Cowboys. It's another week like that. Now, how many weeks like that can you hold up? Because those are extremely pressure filled. Those are exhausting. Those those are physical. It's playoff football right now for the Buffalo Bills, and I think they have the talent to do it. Whether they have the resolve to do it over the next three weeks, we'll see. Which way are you leaning? I'm I'm going to say I'm going to say the Cowboys will win it in a in a very close game. It'll come as no surprise that I've taken the Cowboys as well. <laughs> And they're one and a half point underdogs for, for this game. So we're in agreement for the first two. Let's finish off then with, with a potentially fantastic matchup. Sunday night football, the uh, team with the best record in the AFC, the Baltimore Ravens, travel to Jacksonville to take on the eight and five Jags. Um, the, the Ravens are three and a half point favorites on the road. But it was only 12 months ago, you know, Jeff, that it was at this venue that really you feel the renaissance under Doug Peterson of the, the Jags began by upsetting Lamar Jackson and these Baltimore Ravens. Hey, wait a second now. I, you know, I'm a football coach. What word, what, what did you just, what, what word did you use to describe it? Renaissance. That? Oh my gosh. What a, a bit word. Of culture. You, where did you, where'd you go to university? The, the university of life. It's, there's no better <laughs> one for you, Jeff. <laughs> I, it's where I went to, and it's a pretty hard, they grade real hard. There's nobody grading on the curve in life. Hey, um, Hey, listen, man, I'm going to tell you something. The Ravens, they showed me something last week. They weren't very good. Like, mm. And, you know, the things that they're supposed to be able to do, they didn't do. They didn't get to Matt Stafford on a regular basis. You know, they didn't run the ball particularly well. There were a lot. But you know what? They found a way to win. They found a way to win. And that's the key. They're just tough enough. They're just resilient enough. They're just mature enough to slog out those ugly wins like last week. And that means an awful lot as we get into the playoffs. Um, I think this is going to be really interesting for Jacksonville. Where do they go right now? Because Trevor's hurt a little bit. I think he's hurt more than they say he's hurt because he didn't move around very well in the pocket, threw a bunch of interceptions in the game. Uh, the Jags, again, this is a huge one for the Jags. They need to get... You know, they, they got a break because Texas, the Texans are all beat up now, right, in terms of winning the division. But, you know, you, you're talking about being a, hitting the playoffs at, at stride, being healthy and going on, being on a heater, going into the playoffs. Well, they need this game. Yeah, the Jags are only a, a game ahead of both the Texans and Colts as it stands right now. Um, I agree with you, Trevor Lawrence. It's great to have him out there, but when he can't move around in the pocket and extend players, I think this is a problem, as is the fact that they have no deep threat. Christian Kirk's missing for the next two or three weeks, certainly, and they'll hope to get him back then. And now you're going against a Ravens defense, um, which is just playing great football right now. Um, you know, you, you look at them statistically, they're number two overall. They find ways to take the ball away. Um, they've on offense, they've got this rookie wide receiver, Zay Flowers, Odell Beckham there as well. They seem to be able to find a replacement in Isaiah Likely at tight end uh, for Mark Andrews, who's missing at the moment. The question I have, though, for you is where do you stand on quarterback Lamar Jackson? Because week in, week out, I get frustrated um, with, with his ability to pass the ball. He'll throw passes that you think, yes, he's, he's absolutely there. He's an elite quarterback. And then there's others, as we saw when they went three and out in overtime, when he's throwing passes that his receivers need to be in a different time zone to, to get hold of. What, one Ravens uh, fan that I know very well and respect his opinion um, when it comes to, to Lamar Jackson said to me, look, you just have to live with this right now because purely Lamar's as likely to throw a bad pass as he is to scramble for a 50-yard touchdown. You take the rough with the smooth. Yeah, I think that's that's a pretty fair evaluation because the two balls that he threw to OBJ, OBJ had to track him in, you know, in the air. Like you wouldn't, you shouldn't need to do that on those throws. Those were easier yeah. throws than that. You know, his mechanics aren't great. There's a lot of things that you, you know, he's kind of like that kid. I don't know if you ever played basketball, Richard, but he's kind of like that kid that that you know 
looks kind of sloppy and he throws up three pointers and you say no and then all of a sudden it goes in you go great great shot kid you know <laughs> i mean that's kind of the way he is but you 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 have to live with that because he's so dynamic he kept some plays alive in that game that just i mean it defied description really i mean how in the world he is a houdini you know mm. when it comes to doing that the problem is when he get to the playoffs, and this is why I think that he struggled in the playoffs. When you get to the playoffs against elite defenses, because the 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 Rams do not have an elite defense. They've got an, one elite player in Aaron Donald, and the rest of them are just guys. You get against elite defenses, and the margin for error on balls like that become much, much tighter. And so I'm not convinced yet with Lamar Jackson. In my mind, Lamar Jackson was the second best quarterback on the field last last week. Yes, Matt Stafford played lights out, didn't he, for the Chargers, to be fair, and he's still getting the job done with them. OK, Jeff, uh, picking time then. Baltimore, um, to cover this, would need to win by four on the road in Jacksonville. Do you have that confidence in them? I do, and I think they'll they'll reestablish their running game. You know, Keaton Mitchell's a kind of a dynamic young kid, and if they get him five or six touches along with, you know, the rest of that crew at running back, I think they're going to be all right. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I think they've got more than enough to handle the, the Jags this um, this time around. And I think still in the back of their minds is that defeat um, 12 months ago, which they want to address. So I'll take the Ravens to cover at three and a half as well. Jeff, as always, fantastic to catch up. Um, we never, never have enough time when we're talking uh, together, but it's great to see you. You too, my friend. And, and I look forward to getting you on our podcast real soon and, and hopefully get a chance to see you again. It's, it's been way too long. Yeah, absolutely, because I know already you've done a number of shows around Ireland and the UK. There's more planned for the new year as well, isn't there? Yes, there is, and we better get your butt over there. I, I'm already on that plane. Don't you worry, Jeff. All right, mate. Take, take care. So there we have it. My thanks to Jeff Reinbold for joining us on this week's show. Myself and Jeff in lockstep for the three games picked out for week 15. A reminder that the first one, the Broncos traveling to the Detroit Lions, is the Saturday night football game kicking off at around 1.15 a.m. Sunday morning UK time. Both of us taking the Broncos to cover at plus four. And then it's on to Sunday's action. The Cowboys going to Buffalo to take on the Bills. Both Jeff and I taking the Cowboys to cover at plus 1.5. Before we finish out in Sunday night football, the Baltimore Ravens traveling to Florida to take on the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Ravens, three and a half point favorites going into that one. Both Jeff and I agree they will win that game and cover. So take the Ravens at minus 3.5. As I always point out at this stage in the show, first and foremost, it is about fun. It's about enjoying the games and the action that's on offer. So keep that in mind. If you want to read about the three games we've dis uh, broken down in this week's show, you can read all about them at my website, which is www.rdgmedia.uk. Click on the Talking Sport app, and there you will see NFL Week 15, Overcoming the Odds, three games to watch. Just click on that for all the details. Alternatively, get in touch with me on X at Richard Graves one Alternatively, you can join us and join in the discussion on the Facebook page, Graves on Gridiron, or Instagram, RDG Media UK. I love chatting football, hearing your views, whether they agree with me or not. Uh, but for now, we're entering the final stretch in the regular season. It'll all fold out over the next month, folks. Sit back, enjoy it. There's going to be some drama, tension, and excitement along the way. For now, though, so long, everybody.